Welcome back to The 5% Truth, where we uncover the hidden stories that reveal how much we don't know about the systems meant to protect us. Today, we're going to explore a case that forces us to confront a harsh reality, one where those with power and authority use it not to serve and protect, but to terrorize and destroy. Today, we're peeling back the layers of one of the most egregious cases of police brutality in recent years, the Rankin County torture incident carried out by what is now known as the Goon Squad. These were no rogue officers. They were part of a system that enabled them, a system that turned a blind eye to their abuses until the night of January 24, 2023, when their actions could no longer be hidden. In this episode, We'll take you deep into the lives of the victims, the officers, the community, and the laws that allowed this to happen. But more than just facts, I want to take you on an emotional journey. Imagine, for a moment, the fear of being alone in your home when armed men break in, not to protect you, but to brutalize you simply because of the color of your skin. Imagine the trauma, the betrayal, the pain. This is what we're about to explore. To truly understand this case, we need to look beyond the incident itself and into the history of Rankin County, Mississippi. Like much of the Deep South, this is a place where race, power, and law enforcement have a long and complicated relationship. For decades, Law enforcement in the South has been tainted by accusations of racism, corruption, and the abuse of power. Historically, police forces in Mississippi were often linked with enforcing racial segregation and maintaining the Jim Crow laws that kept Black communities oppressed. The system wasn't built to protect all people equally. It was built to protect some people and control others. Though the civil rights movement of the 1960s brought about legal changes, the underlying attitudes didn't just vanish. In fact, they evolved, morphing into a more insidious form of systemic racism that permeates certain corners of law enforcement to this day. Rankin County, like many places in the South, has a reputation. It's a place where police are feared, not trusted, a place where people of color live with the unspoken understanding that those in uniform may not respect their rights. This sets the stage for what happened on January 24th, 2023. On the surface, these were officers of the lawmen swore to uphold justice. But behind their badges, these six officers earned a different reputation. They called themselves the Goon Squad, a chilling name that reflected their approach to policing. This wasn't about serving the community. It was about power, domination, and fear. Let's take a closer look at who they were. Chief Investigator. He was the one who initially received the complaint about the black men staying at the house. But instead of addressing it properly, he set the wheels of violence in motion. Jeffrey Middleton, a lieutenant, led the squad that night. His leadership was less about upholding the law and more about maintaining control, whatever the cost. Christian Deadman, a narcotics investigator, he would become the trigger man, forcing his colleague to fire the shot that nearly killed MJ. Hunter Elward and Daniel Opidke, both patrol deputies, played their roles in the physical violence and the cover-up. Joshua Hartfield, a narcotics investigator with the Richland Police Department, added his own brand of cruelty, removing surveillance evidence and attempting to burn the victim's clothing. Together, they formed a unit that bent the law, broke it, and then covered their tracks in the most brutal ways imaginable. What's most terrifying is that this wasn't the first time they had done something like this. It was just the first time they were caught. That cold January night started with a phone call, a neighbor's complaint about black men in a white couple's home. But for MJ and EP, that night would become a living nightmare. 
Imagine this. You're sitting in your home, a place where you should feel safe, when suddenly your doors are kicked in. The men who storm into your house aren't strangers or criminals. They are police officers. But instead of offering protection, they beat you. They tase you. They hurl racial slurs at you as if your very existence offends them. For MJ and EP, there was no reasoning, no mercy. The goon squad didn't come to investigate. They came to terrorize. The torture was relentless. At one point, Officer Daniel Opidki grabbed a dildo and attempted to sexually assault the men. The sheer terror of that moment caused MJ to defecate on himself out of fear. But even that wasn't enough to make them stop. The officers forced both men to strip naked and shower, washing away the physical evidence of their abuse. But there's no shower on earth that can cleanse the psychological scars left behind by such an ordeal. And then, the moment that could have turned this into a murder case. MJ was handcuffed, unable to defend himself, when Deadman fired a gun into another room. But that wasn't enough for these officers. Deadman then forced Elward to take aim at MJ and pull the trigger. A bullet pierced MJ's mouth, shattering his teeth and exiting through his neck. It's a miracle that he survived, but what's truly horrifying is what happened next. As MJ bled on the floor, these officers, who had just nearly killed a man, didn't rush to get help. No. Instead, they came together to craft a lie, a web of deceit so intricate that it would take months to untangle. They agreed to plant a throwdown gun on MJ, making it look like he had threatened them. They would claim that he had given them permission to search his pockets, where they would plant methamphetamine to further criminalize him. They even planned to frame him as the aggressor, saying that Elward had shot him in self-defense. This wasn't just a crime. It was a calculated betrayal of everything the justice system is supposed to stand for. This case, horrifying as it is, isn't unique. It's part of a long history of racial violence in America, violence that is often excused, overlooked, or covered up. The idea of planting evidence, framing victims, and using excessive force isn't new. In fact, it's a tactic that dates back to the days of Jim Crow. Let's take a moment to step back in time. In the early 20th century, Southern law enforcement was deeply intertwined with maintaining white supremacy. Police officers were often members of the Ku Klux Klan, or at the very least, sympathetic to their cause. They didn't protect black citizens, they policed them, using intimidation and violence to ensure racial hierarchy remained intact. When officers abused their power, there were few consequences. Sound familiar? What happened in Rankin County in 2023 is a modern echo of this past. It's a reminder that the legacy of racial violence hasn't disappeared. It's evolved, manifesting in new forms, but always with the same goal, control through fear. Cases like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and countless others are not isolated incidents. They are part of a continuum of violence that stretches back over a century. And while each case sparks outrage and calls for reform, the deeper issue remains. A system that allows, and at times encourages, this behavior. When the news of the Rankin County incident broke, it sent shockwaves through the community. Protests erupted and people demanded answers. How could this happen in their town? How could the very people sworn to protect them turn out to be the ones inflicting harm. In the days following the incident, it became clear that trust between law enforcement and the community, particularly the Black community, was shattered. Rankin County, like many parts of the South, already had a fraught relationship with race and law enforcement. But this event tore open old wounds that hadn't fully healed, 
Residents held vigils, marches, and public forums, demanding accountability and transparency. But the trauma runs deep. For many, the question isn't just, how did this happen? But how many more times has it happened without anyone knowing? Remember, McAlpin and Middleton explicitly threatened their colleagues, saying that if anyone revealed the truth about what happened that night, they would be killed. This isn't just an abuse of power, it's a total hijacking of justice. How can a community trust a system where law enforcement officers not only commit violent crimes, but also use fear and intimidation to silence witnesses, including their own? Rankin County wasn't just mourning the victims of that night. It was grappling with the larger reality of what this case exposed. This wasn't just about six officers. It was about a system that allowed them to operate with impunity, a culture that protected them, and a legal framework that had, until now, failed to hold them accountable. The community was torn between hope for justice and a deep-seated cynicism that the justice system had long since lost its way. Many ask the same question that echoes through every case of police violence. Will this be any different? As we dive deeper into the legal side of this case, it becomes clear that the charges brought against the Rankin County Goon Squad were not just about individual actions, but about a concerted, premeditated conspiracy to violate civil rights. These men didn't just act on impulse. They worked together to conceal their crimes, tamper with evidence, and fabricate a story that would shift the blame onto the victims. The charges were significant. Conspiracy against rights under federal law. This is a serious charge, carrying the weight of one of the most sacred protections in our Constitution. The right to be free from unreasonable search and seizure, the right to due process, and the right to be free from unlawful violence at the hands of the state. Deprivation of rights under color of law. In other words, the officers abuse their authority as law enforcement to commit these acts. Obstruction of justice and conspiracy to obstruct justice. They didn't just brutalize MJ and EP. They actively tried to cover it up by falsifying documents, intimidating witnesses, and fabricating evidence. The court documents reveal a chilling level of coordination. Each officer had a role to play in the cover-up. Elward and Deadman, the shooters, stuck to the story that MJ had provoked them. Middleton, the leader, orchestrated the plan to plant the BB gun on MJ O. Hartfield. The narcotics investigator went so far as to burn evidence and remove the surveillance footage, dumping it in a creek. Opetki, the patrol deputy, searched for and concealed the shell casing from Deadman's first shot going out of his way to hide it in tall grass to avoid detection. This was a methodical, cold-blooded effort to evade responsibility. But despite their efforts, the evidence was undeniable. Federal investigators, working through the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation, pieced together the truth. But beyond the legal ramifications, let's pause for a moment to consider the human cost of this tragedy. What happens to people like MJ and EP who survive such horrific violence? Psychologically, the trauma of being attacked, degraded, and nearly killed by law enforcement leaves scars that never fully heal. For MJ, who was shot in the mouth and forced to endure unimaginable terror, the physical pain is only part of the story. The deeper wounds are emotional, the loss of safety, the fear of those who are supposed to protect, and the realization that the system can turn on you in an instant. Post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, is a common result of such violence. Victims of police brutality often live with chronic anxiety, flashbacks, nightmares, and an overwhelming sense of vulnerability. Every knock at the door, every police siren, can trigger panic. The idea that the same people who are sworn to protect you 
could be the ones who harm you is a betrayal of the highest order, and it can take years, if ever, to recover from that level of trauma. The victims in this case, like so many others, will carry these emotional scars for the rest of their lives. MJ and EP are more than names in a court case. They are human beings whose lives were forever altered by the actions of six men who saw them as less than human. This case isn't happening in isolation. We live in a time when the national conversation about police brutality and systemic racism has reached a boiling point. In the past decade, the deaths of unarmed Black people at the hands of police, such as George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Eric Garner, and too many others, have sparked protests, riots, and calls for sweeping reforms in law enforcement. What happened in Rankin County is part of a much larger pattern of racial violence by police across America. At its core, this is a story about power and who gets to wield it. It's about what happens when the people entrusted with that power see themselves as above the law, when they stop being guardians of the community and start being its greatest threat. The chilling reality is that the goon squad wasn't just a group of rogue officers. They were a symptom of a much deeper problem, a system that allows racism and brutality to flourish, unchecked. The use of excessive force against people of color, the planting of evidence, and the cover-up of police crimes are all part of a larger narrative in American law enforcement that we, as a nation, are only just beginning to fully grapple with. Rankin County is now one more place on a growing list of communities left to pick up the pieces after a devastating incident of police violence. The question remains, how many more times will we see this before real, lasting change takes hold? In the wake of the Rankin County torture case, the calls for police reform have grown louder. Community leaders, activists, and legal experts have all weighed in, demanding not just justice for MJ and EP, but a complete overhaul of how law enforcement operates in Rankin County and beyond. But what does reform actually look like? For some, it means stricter accountability measures, body cameras that can't be turned off, and an end to qualified immunity, the legal doctrine that often shields police officers from civil lawsuits. For others, it means defunding police departments and reallocating resources to social services, mental health support, and community-based safety programs. The Rankin County case shines a light on the urgent need for systemic change. We're not just talking about a few bad apples here. We're talking about a culture that enables and even rewards this kind of behavior. Until that culture changes, there will be more cases like this, more victims, more broken communities. But there's also hope. Cases like this, when exposed to the public, force a conversation that can't be ignored. The protests, the demands for transparency, and the relentless push for justice mean that people are no longer willing to accept the status quo. They're demanding a future where police brutality is no longer tolerated, where corruption isn't covered up, and where victims are heard, not silenced. So, where do we go from here? The Rankin County torture incident isn't just a story of one horrific night. It's a window into a system that needs to be torn down and rebuilt from the ground up. It's a reminder that the fight for justice is ongoing and that we cannot look away from the corruption that festers in the dark corners of power. MJ and EP are survivors, but they shouldn't have had to endure what they did. And there shouldn't be more stories like theirs. But the truth is, unless real reform takes place, we will continue to see these kinds of abuses of power. As we close today's episode, I want to leave you with this. Change doesn't happen because the system wants it to. It happens because people demand it. 
the community in Rankin County, the nation as a whole, and each one of us has a role to play in pushing for that change. Thank you for joining me on this emotional journey through the Rankin County torture case. If this episode has moved you, if it has opened your eyes to the painful reality of corruption in our justice system, then I urge you, stay informed, stay engaged, and don't let this story be forgotten. Until next time, stay vigilant. And remember, sometimes the truth is buried beneath layers of lies and power. But if we keep digging, we can bring it to the surface. Our ongoing series, The 5% Truth, focuses on wrongful convictions. Please consider listening to those episodes as well. You can find them on the podcast tab here on YouTube. Thank you for listening.